Okay, ready? Okay, welcome everyone to our conference, our Northeast Epilepsy Educational Exchange. And thank you for sharing your time with us this evening. We're happy that you could give us this time. And if you're here, we know that you're as interested in epilepsy as we are. So your audio and video will be muted during the presentation. You'll have the opportunity to ask questions via the chat box um, and your questions will be presented to the speaker after his or her presentation. So our conference schedule looks like uh, we'll have welcome introductions until 6.10 and then at 6.10 our keynote presentation devices for treatment of epilepsy and seizure detection will be presented by Dr. Michael Sperling which will be followed by question and answers from 6.40 till 7. Then at 7, cognitive and behavioral changes in epilepsy will be presented by Dr. Aaron Esposito, followed by question and answers from 7.30 till 7.50. And then 7.50 till 8, don't go anywhere because we're going to have upcoming EFEPA events, some exciting news to share with everyone. So I will turn this over now to Melissa will introduce our sponsors. Hi Mary, thank you so much and good evening everyone. I would like to echo Mary's words and thank you all for attending tonight. This conference would not be possible without the help of our healthcare partners, the hard work and dedication of Mary and Rena, as well as our generous sponsors. Huge thank you to our conference series sponsors who made tonight's webinar possible as well as the three exchanges throughout the year. Greenwich Biosciences, UCB, ASI, and Synovian. Thank you again for your support. It is my pleasure to give a warm welcome to Jen from Greenwich Biosciences, who will be sharing a few words with us tonight. Over to you, Jen. Thanks, Melissa. Um, thanks so much for allowing us to be part of this event. Um, Greenwich Bioscience is focused on discovering, developing, and commercializing novel therapeutics from its proprietary cannabinoid product platform. It's our passion and purpose to continually seek solutions that transform the lives of those living with rare and severe neurological diseases. Again, thanks so much. No, thank you, Jen. I'd also like to take this opportunity to introduce our partners at ASI. Danielle and Nicole. Welcome, it's all you. Hi, thank you for having us. Um, on behalf of my colleague, Nicole Alessino and myself, I just like to say thank you to the Epile Epilepsy Foundation um, of Eastern PA to have us as a sponsor, just to give a little bit of information about ASI. At ASI Incorporated, human healthcare is our goal. We give our first thoughts to patients and their families in helping to increase the benefits healthcare provides. As the US pharmaceutical subsidiary of Tokyo-based Azai Company Limited, we have a passionate commitment to patient care that is the driving force behind our efforts to help address unmet medical needs. We are a fully integrated pharmaceutical business with discovery, clinical, and marketing capabilities. Our key areas of focus include oncology and neurology. To learn more about Azai Incorporated, please visit us at www.azi.com backslash US and follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Thank you so much. Thanks, Danielle. Danielle. And now a big thank you to our vendor sponsors, Supernus and SK Life Science. Thank you so much for your support of this event. Stephanie is here from SK Life Science to tell you more. Over to you, Stephanie. Thank you, Melissa, and thanks for the introduction. Um, so as Melissa said, I'm from SK Life Science. And just a little bit about us at SK Life Science, everything that we do is with the purpose of supporting patients, caregivers, and the entire CNS community. We're a global pharmaceutical company focused on the research, development, and treatment of CNS disorders and are the US subsidiary of SK Biopharmaceuticals based in Korea. In addition to having a treatment approved in the US for partial onset seizures in adults, the companies have a pipeline of eight compounds in development for CNS disorders, including epilepsy. Our mission remains the same, 
As long as there are unmet needs in the epilepsy and CNS community, we will keep working. We will continue to explore the complex mysteries of the brain to find answers for patients, caregivers, and healthcare professionals. For more than 50 years, the Epilepsy Foundation has been fighting on the front lines to advocate for and support the 3.4 million people with epilepsy in the United States. We share the Foundation's sense of urgency and its deep commitment to addressing the needs of people with epilepsy by increasing awareness, innovation, and opportunities. So thank you so much, Melissa. Thanks to the Foundation for having us part of this conference tonight. Thank you, Stephanie. And once again, we cannot express our gratitude enough to our partners, whose dependable support is vital now more than ever. Thank you for having me tonight, Mary. And thanks again to Jen, Danielle, Nicole, and Stephanie for joining us and sharing a few of the words. Back to you, Mary. Thanks, Melissa. And thank you, ladies. And thank you, all of our sponsors. So you are not alone. 3.4 million is the number of people in the United States who have active epilepsy. One third of the people with epilepsy who live with uncontrolled seizures because no medical treatments are able to work for them. So you may be one of those people, but we're going to give you some hope tonight with more information. One in 26 is the number of people in the United States that will develop epilepsy at some point in their lifetime. Six out of 10 is the number of people with epilepsy where the cause is unknown. 110,000 people are the number living in Eastern Pennsylvania alone with epilepsy. The Epilepsy Foundation of Eastern Pennsylvania serves 18 counties. They're the ones highlighted in purple. We are focused on education, support, and advocacy. We're here for you as we've been for 45 years. Our mission is to stop seizures and SUDEP find a cure and overcome the challenges created by epilepsy through efforts, including education, advocacy, and research to accelerate ideas into therapies. The EFEPA programs and services are our project School Alert, where we go into schools, we train the teachers what to look for, we train students, whether there's someone in their class that has epilepsy or in their school, but we try to get them to know early on how to react to seizures and recognize them. We tra train first responders and law enforcement, transitional services for youth going into adulthood, going to college or maybe on their own. We have support groups throughout our area. We advocate for people, uh, whether it's attending social security meetings with them or uh, if they get arrested unjustly, we've gone to court to advocate in their behalf. We are having educational conferences and seminars. Uh, we give INRs to schools. We help parents with those in the 504 plans. We have Camp Achieve, which is a week long sleepover camp for children ages eight to 17 every summer. This year, of course, it was virtually, but it was still a great week. We have adult services and we have young adult retreats. Now, how can you get involved? raise awareness. November is coming up. It's Epilepsy Awareness Month and we have some activities. As I said, at the end of the program, you're going to hear some really good ideas. Um, advocate for epilepsy support services. Follow and share our posts on social media. Volunteer. We're always looking for help. Invite the EFEPA to do an educational program at your workplace or your children's school or the police or fire station in your community. Attend EFEPA events and fundraise for EFEPA. So now without delay, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Michael Sperling. He's a Baldwin Keys Professor of Neurology, Vice Chair of Research for the Sidney Kimmel Medical College at Thomas Jefferson University. I know he doesn't want me to say all these accolades, but I'm going to say most of them. He's the director of Jefferson Comprehensive Epilepsy Center, and he serves on the faculty, or he served for UCLA and the University of Pennsylvania prior to Thomas Jefferson University. He's internationally known, and he's constantly traveling the world. If you're trying to get an appointment, you know he is very busy and very renowned. He's published over 400 peer-reviewed papers, reviews, book chapters, and several books. 
Um, he is a former president of the Philadelphia Neurological Society, and I am very partial because he is dealing with my son and he's an excellent doctor. So without further ado, Dr. Sperling. Thank you very much. I will share my screen and then we can get started. So we're sharing that. Let me put this up. Okay, good. So everybody should be able to see my screen. Now, Mary, can you confirm that you, you've, got, you've got my title screen? Yep, we can see it. Okay, good. Just want to make certain we have no problems. So I'm going to talk a bit about devices and the diagnosis and treatment of seizures. And I'm actually going to start with a pretty simple device, um, which is one in everybody's pocket or purse or on your, on your table or wherever uh, that you can use to help, help, help treat yourself and diagnose yourself. You know, I, I'm going to introduce by showing this slide and, you know, you could argue that, you know, early on, you know, this goes back to the 1800s to show that there were a few drugs in the 1850s, bromides, and then early 1900s, phenobarbital and peraldehyde, a couple of drugs, but it, it was really the age where you used public health. I mean, it was, it was really a public health method. I mean, the, the average life expectancy increased by 15 or 20 years between 1890 and 1910 in the U.S. And it had nothing to do with medicine. It had to do with implementing sewage systems and, and getting clean water into cities. And, and this is where it really made a difference. And, and cities started building parks, Fairmount Park in Philadelphia, Central Park in New York, parks in other cities. And public health made a difference. But then starting in the 1920s, 1930s, and especially after the 1940s, you, we could call it the age of antibiotics, the age of medications, and you could see for epilepsy and seizures, you know, phenytoin, brand name Dylan, was invented in the late 1930s, and acetazolamide, and it kind of increased through the 70s, and then in the past 30 years, starting in the early 1990s, a number of drugs hit the market, so it's climbed up. And, you know, we could argue that there was the age of antibiotics with Alexander Fleming and the invention of the discovery of penicillin in the 20s and then sulfas in the 40s and, and so forth. We got to molecular things. Genetics have become, you know, widely available and studied in the 2000s. But where are we now? We're really, if you think about it, the last 10, 20, 30 years, the age of technology. I mean, this little computer that we carry on ourselves that we call a cell phone is more powerful than the world's largest computers were in the 1950s. And it, it's really made a difference. And this technology has mattered a lot uh, in terms of advancing, advancing medicine and advancing science. And if you think about it, most of the significant advances that have been made in taking care of people with any kind of condition uh, and in our lives has, has been related to technology. You know, diagnostically, I remember when MRI was invented and it was like a whole new window open to the brain that we couldn't see before. Uh, new to various techniques, robots are now used all over. In addition to a robot, you know, vacuuming my rugs yesterday and uh, mopping my kitchen floor, uh, surgeons use robots in the operating room. Amazon is using robots in its warehouses. Uh, so technology has really come through. And it, it, the interesting thing is it doesn't replace us. It, it, it augments what we do and it's really made a difference. So in devices, can, how can we use this to help people improve their ability to manage their seizures, to manage their epilepsy? And can we provide information to do that? Can we get better information about seizures uh, so that we can help people care for themselves better, help doctors and nurses and uh, physicians assistants and others who are, are, are trying to be helpful, help care for people who have seizures Maybe can we learn more about the seizures where they start in the brain? Can we use these devices to prevent complications of epilepsy? Unfortunately, as many of you know, it's possible to have injuries during seizures. Uh, it is possible to die, unfortunately, with a seizure. Uh, and we want to limit and really try to avoid all, as much injury as possible. And, and ultimately, can we then use devices not only to prevent complications, but to prevent seizures or abort them once they've started? So there are a number of things that we can do. And, and one of them that I'll just briefly introduce, I think, I suspect many of you are aware of it already, uh, are self-management apps. And, and even before that, I mean, the people on this conference don't need to be told, the ability 
to get online and get information in general from a reliable source, which is not a chat room, but reliable sources, and also to interact with your healthcare professionals. So we all are living in the middle of a terrible pandemic right now where contact with others is critical, but carries some risk. And uh, how have healthcare professionals dealt with this by massively shifting to online doctor visits, nurses visits, visits with psychologists, visits with psychiatrists, social workers, etc. What we've been able to do is minimize the number of people coming to medical facilities unnecessarily. Uh, if we can deliver that healthcare and the information online. So those of you on this program know how to do it. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't know how, and I would encourage everyone to talk to people that you know or relatives that don't know and work with them and try to help them so they have access. It really makes a difference. There, you know, there are dangers to being online too. There are huge amounts of social media sites filled with misinformation, sadly filled with hate, filled with distrust, uh, but there are lots of good places uh, and many good places where you can get information and you can use it to connect with other people and maintain that normal human interaction. We had various holiday uh, functions earlier this year via Zoom. We had a 30 person uh, dinner in April uh, for my family and friends because we couldn't all get together in my house. Uh, we have dinners using the same Zoom platform with friends and family members occasionally. Uh, when if they live far away or they or they live close, more, especially when things were getting ugly in in the spring, and we were we really wanted to remain in in a, in a bit of a bubble. And this fall, as the COVID pandemic is really picking up again, being able to use this technology helps you remain connected with others, which I think is important psychologically, uh, and it also can keep you connected with your healthcare professionals. Now let's go to some apps and we'll talk about some things. So there are some apps that are available. The Epilepsy Foundation has a, has a very nice app called Seizure Tracker, which provides a lot of information that you can use. And I would encourage everybody to go to the Epilepsy Foundation's website. And that's one that you can download. And there are other ones. And, and these apps, if they're well-designed, they contain information that you can educate yourself and educate others. You can register information about life factors for yourself and triggers, track what you're doing. You can track your treatment. You can create partnership with your healthcare team through some of these apps. You can monitor yourself by keeping a diary. You can video yourself on your phone with these. And again, as I talked about social connections through the Zoom platform or others, Google, Google Hangouts is another one or Google Meets. Uh, there are a variety, of form, a variety of places where you can do that. There's social media sites where people with various interests can get together and people with seizures can do that too. There are a couple of apps that I'm going to mention these, not because I think they're better or worse than any others, simply that there's some published data. So this is a, an app that was designed really, you know, it's called Ep App for Self-Management. And it's been used in adolescence, and I'll show you some data, uh, where you can actually go into it and get information. So on the top left here, there's, it says, learn and understand epilepsy. And the first line is, what is epilepsy? You can click on this little carrot, it gives you information. What causes epilepsy? What are seizures? Safety and lifestyle issues, traveling with epilepsy, informational things that you can have. This line, it says 50% of your seizures happen on a Monday. You can log your seizures and this app will then tell you something semi-useful like that. You know when to be more cautious or you, make a, you can set up your profile, you can get your stats, you can keep a diary in here and then you can set up settings. So you can actually learn about epilepsy and log information and maybe learn a little bit more and get an idea of what your seizures are related to. This is a paper that was published in a, a journal a couple of years ago in the Journal of Clinical Neuroscience by a, a group in Australia. They had 51 patients aged 13 to 19. And basically they gave them this app and they looked at how did they do it baseline? And then what happened after they got in the habit of using this? And you can see, for example, baseline medication reminders. How often did they need to be reminded at the beginning to take their medicine? And this is 6.64 times a month. Afterwards, 2.93 per month. And then long-term follow-up, 3.54. So this was statistically significant that when people got in the habit of doing this, they became more reliable with their medicine. How often were they having seizures? Nearly four per month. 
it dropped to 0.96. Now you'd say it dropped by nearly a quarter because of the magic of statistics that was not statistically significant. And it could simply be in a, by chance that says that this is, is, is not relevant. But the point is you could track this and if they had a larger number of patients, maybe they would have seen something or maybe not. So the number of medication reminders improved and people could track how they're doing. And it's very usually, very, very easy to use. They're, they tend to be friendly. There's another app called EpiDiary by an Israeli company called Erodi uh, that is used by pharmaceutical companies to help people in trials track what's happening, but it's really meant to be used by anybody. And, and this can integrate with um, medical professionals, healthcare records. So it's a graphic interface. I, it's, it's certainly more appealing than the last one I showed you, but you can track different things. You know, like for this, I had a seizure. This one, I didn't have a seizure. There's maybe a trigger. You can experience side effects. So you can register how you feel. It actually has pill recognition technology built in. So it'll identify medicine for you. It provides reminders. And again, it's another technique to track how you're feeling. Did you take your medicine? Did you miss medicine? What happened? And I, I think these things can be overused. It's careful not to drive yourself crazy tracking things, uh, but sometimes it gets you in the habit of doing something. And then after a while, maybe you don't need to do it anymore. Uh, but these, these kinds of apps are useful. And only you will know what's best for you or worse for you. And some things don't work. I've seen some people pay so much attention to this that I think it's not good for their psychological health. I've seen others who haven't paid enough attention to use this and it helps them focus a little bit more. So I would encourage people to use this. So this is technology and it's sort of a device. It's, it, it goes on your phone or you can do it on a computer. Let's talk about seizure detection now. So why do we wanna do seizure detection? So I'll state it very plainly. To properly treat people with epilepsy, to properly treat people, we have to identify seizures. As a doctor, that's how I know. Right? I ask you, are you having seizures or not? We can determine then whether they've stopped after prescribing therapy and we can assess for side effects and we try to have a balance between seizure control and medication tolerability. So our key indicator really when we're evaluating and treating somebody with seizures and epilepsy is seizure. It works well if you're not having them. If you are having them, then our treatment needs to improve. Well, how do we determine it? And we rely upon taking the history from the patient, from family members, from friends or whoever else. If you think about it, 2,000 years ago, you know, a Roman or Greek doctor or any other culture, a Chinese doctor or African doctor, uh, doctor in, in, in North or South America, uh, if you, that person was treating somebody with seizures, with epilepsy, they got the information the same way I do today. It hasn't changed. All you can do is ask the person, ask relevant people around that person, and we rely upon this. So, to, and, and this is what we base our seizures on. Do I need to change your medicine? Do I need to alter it? Do I recommend surgery? What do we do? So you think about it, there's not a whole lot of technology involved and we modify the treatment based on this. But the question is how reliable is that information that patients and their family give? And what is the evidence? So there was a very interesting study published five years ago by a group in Germany. They did a survey of their patients and of their patients' families. They asked them to fill out a survey how to, asking them straightforward, how do you do? How reliable are you at re recognizing your seizures? And then they asked the family members who live with the patients, how reliable are you at identifying seizures? And in fact, patients, if you ask them, say, they don't think they're so good at noticing their seizures, at, especially at night. And nighttime seizures, 29%, we'll look at this on the right, thought they never noticed daytime seizures and 47% said that they missed more than half, and then 54% people thought they never noticed their nighttime seizures. And 79%, so the vast majority, thought they missed more than half of their nighttime seizures. So if we ask people, and presumably there are people listening to this uh, that I'm saying now, you know, you could post yourself, and some people are very reliable. They know, they know for sure. Uh, we know that when we monitor people on the epilepsy unit, that even people who think they're completely reliable miss some because you don't know what happened when you're out of touch, especially in sleep. So the patients, whoops, I hit that, often think they miss seizures awake and especially think they miss it at sleep. And if you ask family members, family members think they're better. They say they only miss 29% of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, nighttime seizures and notice the rest, but they also think that they miss a lot. So we're making decisions based on information that we that patients and their families think are not as 
ideal, that they're not quite so accurate. And, and, and it has real implications. I, unfortunately, this year, you know, I had a patient who thought he was seizure free, uh, who was out driving and had a serious accident, had a seizure. He didn't know, and he didn't realize he had the seizure. He just knew later that there had been an accident. And if he had not had an accident, he wouldn't have known. So we make decisions that can lead to life and death situations. One of my former fellows, a doctor I trained, uh, named Bill Tatum, who's down in Florida, published a study a couple of, uh, a couple of decades ago in 2001, where he had 552 ambulatory EEGs from 502 patients. And it was very interesting. People were told to push the button and write something down in the diary when you have a symptom that you think might be epilepsy or seizure related. And it's interesting, 854 alarms people pushed for symptoms a seizure was noted in only 132 of those. So 13% of the alarms were actually seizures. 87% of things reported as possibly epilepsy related were not seizures. So are these people who are then coming into the office saying I'm still having symptoms and then I as the doctor or that person's doctor, Dr. Tatum says, whoops, you're having seizures still. Let me change your medicine. Let me raise the dose. Maybe it doesn't need to be done. On the flip side, 47 of the EEGs out of 552 had seizures in them, but only 29 of those records did patients say that they thought they had an EEG during it. So 61%, so nearly 40% of the 24-hour sessions that had seizures, the patients didn't know that they'd had one. It was only picked up by the seizure. And people who had absent seizures, in the special, especially, were often unaware of it. So patients don't think that they're as reliable as they could be because they don't, they're just not aware, they lose touch, especially if they don't have an aura. And then when we do official monitoring with EEG, we discover, yes, that is in fact the case, that a significant percentage of seizures are not recognized uh, overall. And again, some people may be very good and others may have much more difficulty in recognizing it. I have some patients, I have one gentleman I see who's a very nice man and every time I come in and I ask him, how are you doing? He haven't had any seizures for years. And that's why I said, you have seizures every week. You don't know you have them. He said, if I don't, have, if I don't know, I don't have them. And with it, I watched the two of them have an entertaining discussion for a few minutes before I interrupt them on occasion. Uh, so it, it it's, it's use, would be useful to know. It's a problem because, again, our primary cr criteria for assessing efficacy of treatment relies then on flawed data. If people and their families don't notice seizures and report symptoms that may not be, especially at night, we're treating based on unreliable data, as I said. And we may decide that somebody is controlled when that person is not, and that could put you at risk if you, you then have to drive or you're engaging in other activities. We might say you're uncontrolled when it's not true, that the symptoms aren't epileptic, and maybe we don't need to change therapy. And so medical decisions and lifestyle decisions that affect safety are there. And, and what are the consequences? The consequences are significant. So we can do ambulatory seizure detection, ideally, and then get better objective data that compensates for what people can't know necessarily and what families don't necessarily know and ideally be able to improve seizure control. So we can alter therapy to suit the situation, have the potential for fewer drug side effects in some people because we're not treating symptoms that aren't seizures and hopefully make an earlier diagnosis of non-epileptic symptoms. So how can we detect seizures? And there are a number of ways of doing it using single modality and multiple modality. So the old fashioned way, which is biological as a dog, uh, that is not a real seizure dog on the right in the picture, but it is a dog and there, there are some dogs that have been trained to detect seizures. The scientific data behind these dogs is not as strong as many people would like. Uh, I have had patients bring dogs into the hospital while they were there for monitoring. And I, we've seen many videos of someone in bed having a seizure and the dog is just kind of snoozing on the floor next to the bed or in the chair or snoozing next to the person in the chair. Some dogs are very reliable, some dogs are not. But, uh, uh, but it is one method. We can look at EKG monitoring or EMG, that's electromyography, so measuring muscle activity. I'll show examples of that. And then there are other scientific methods, accelerometry, looking at the rate of acceleration of movement of an arm, for example, changes in pressure, electrodermal activity, which is the electrical activity on the skin. So when you have a lie detector test, this is what they're measuring. They're measuring changes in electrical activity of the skin. You can actually analyze video. We can look at temperature. We can use that technique called photoplethysmography, which looks at blood flow 
in a finger or another area in a wrist to see increased blood flow, maybe there's a seizure, and we can even look at EEG remotely in an ambulatory way too. So let me show you a few examples of how this works. Uh, if, to interpret these examples, what we need to know is the sensitivity and the specificity of the techniques, however. So what is sensitivity? What it sounds like, how sensitive is it? If there are 100 seizures, what proportion of the seizures are picked up? A very sensitive device will pick up 99 or 98 or maybe 100 of the 100 seizures. A device that's not very sensitive might only pick up 50 or 60 of them. We want a sensitive device because we don't want to miss them. What is specificity? Specificity is how often is the device picking something up that isn't what we want? So is it a specific detection or is it a wrong detection? So for example, if the device detects 100 seizures, are all 100 seizures or only 30 of them seizures and 70 or something else? Or are only two of them seizures and 98 of them something else? So arguably, if you have a device that's detecting things and most of what it detects is not a seizure or, or any kind of event of interest, it's not terribly useful. So these are critical. So you want accurate detection and again, that low false positive rate. If it's positive, you want it to be because excessive false detections makes the device less useful. Kind of like the boy who cried wolf. If you're out in the woods, uh, you know, out the, rather in the fields guarding the sheep and you keep crying wolf, wolf, wolf all the time, after a while, nobody's gonna come and then the wolves have a party when they come. When these devices are tested, often they're tested in, in inpatient epilepsy monitoring units where movement is limited. So it's not really real world and we're working on that. So let's talk about movement detection first. So this is a simple way, this is a bed alarm. There's a company called MFIT that makes a bed alarm. It's just a pad, you can see it on the right here. It goes onto the mattress and it detects if somebody's shaking. Uh, I wouldn't recommend this device. Uh, it's old, I don't even know if you buy it anymore. Uh, this paper you can see is seven years old. Uh, and this is from a, a Dutch company in the Netherlands, but they monitored 45 patients, but 26 had 78 seizures. And it, of the tonic-clonic, so the grand mal type seizures, it detected 11 of, thir of 13 seizures, so 86% while asleep, and 12 of 16 while awake. So that's not bad, it's not perfect, but it's not bad. And of the complex partial or focal impaired awareness seizures, so the ones where you're not shaking violently all over, it detected less than half, five out of 14, provided they had motor involvement, so there was movements. And other seizure types, very low detection rate. So for somebody who is having tonic-clonic seizures or grand mal seizures in sleep, it's not a bad device. And the one nice thing about this is it doesn't require any work on anybody's part other than putting the pad there once and then it's there for an alarm. There are better techniques that I'll show you though, uh, but it's an idea of one way of monitoring that's not creepy and not excessively invasive. Now we can look at EMG, electromyography or muscle activity detection. And these are two devices that are approved, they're out. Uh, one is called Nightwatch, looks like this. The other is the SPIAC by Brain Sentinel, and it's a device that goes on the biceps. Uh, I was involved in the development and studies of the SPIAC device, and I was not involved with the Nightwatch, which was developed in Europe. This is FDA approved. So they sit on the muscle, and they look for the muscle activity characteristic of seizures. So they're only good for tonic-clonic or grand mal seizures, and not good for other types. So let me show you an example on the graph here on the right. So AF and coach show the EMG signal. So here, if we look here, this is a real tonic-clonic seizure. Somebody had a tonic-clonic or grand mal seizure. And this is the muscle activity. So this is going before. And then this really tight activity shows, and this is tw seconds. So 20 seconds, 40 seconds, 60 and 80. So this is over, over a period of about 90 seconds total. And you can see that there's very tight muscle activity, it builds up and then towards the end, it kind of peters out and you can see it opens up. So people stiffen at the start and that's why it's solid because it's continuous muscle contraction. And then as the jerking slows, you can see the individual jerks breaking out and then it stops. They had another example where they asked somebody, shake like you're having a seizure. And these were people who in theory knew what seizures looked like, I think these were physicians. And you can see the physicians trying to mimic the shaking of a seizure couldn't do it. It just looks quite different. And then this is somebody who has a psychogenic non-epileptic seizure, so a stress seizure, an attack that comes out of the blue from stress, underlying psychological stresses, who may have violent shaking also. And again, you can appreciate this pattern of muscle activity looks very different than that. 
So the bottom line is you don't have to be a doctor to interpret this. You can look at this pattern and that pattern and know what's different. This is another way of looking at it. There's really high frequency activity, very fast activity in the muscle that's going at you know, 40, 60 times per second and, and low frequency, very slow, maybe shaking one or two times per second. And you can see the tonic-clonic seizure, the ratio of high to low frequency activity pops up with a fast peak and comes, whoops, I went forward, pops up and goes down fast. So this is a very characteristic pattern. This is a mathematical analysis, which is nice. The person trying to mimic a seizure or the person not trying to mimic but having a psychological attack just doesn't look like that. So we can apply a little bit of mathematics and then a computer can translate this into this and then fire an alarm when the seizure happens and say, oh, seizure has happened with, with good reliability. So in a study done in Denmark with that uh, study, uh, with that first device, the sensitivity was 93.8%. So it detected 30 of 32 tonic-clonic seizures. Uh, and it picked it up within nine seconds. And both seizures that were missed were the second seizure after a first seizure. The issue was that the false positive rate was 0.67 seizures per day. So you can imagine at the end of 30 days, two thirds of that is 20. In a typical month, there would be 20 false detections, right? If you are having a seizure once a month or once every two months or once every three months, let's say once every three months, you're going to have 60 false detections and one true detection. This device is not terribly useful if that's the case. On the other hand, only two thirds of patients, in, rather in two thirds of patients, actually there were no false detections. So these false detections on average were only in a minority of patients. So if you're one of the people who doesn't have false detections, it's a great device. If you're somebody with false detections, it may not be it may not be terrific. Now, again, you could argue if you get a false detection, you run down the hall, if you live with the person uh, uh, and don't sleep with that person to check to see if the person's seizing. But if you kept being awakened at night or at other times uh, during the day or were disturbed because you, if there's a seizure, after a while you would give up. So this becomes an issue. There were 161 other kinds of seizures that people had during this. So the milder seizures, complex partial or focal impaired awareness or tonic seizures or atonics or drop attacks and some non-epileptic seizures and none of those were detected. So this is only good for tonic clonic or grand mal seizures. And again, you need to be, I think in this group of the two thirds of the people who don't have false positives and then it works reasonably reliably. In this study with the Brain Sentinel, the SPIAC study, the device sensitivity was 76%. So it picked up 35 of 46 seizures. And why did it miss it? Well, in op with optimal placement, 29 out of 29, but people aren't perfect. So a quarter of the time, the device was not placed properly by the person putting it on or it slipped out of position. So again, it's pretty good. Picking up 76% is better than picking up none. And the false alarm rate, however, was 2.5 per day. So at the end of a month, think about it, 75 detections on average. And if somebody has one seizure a month, you've got one real seizure for every Seven, every 76 detections, that might not be acceptable, but similarly to the last one, about two thirds of the people had no false positives. So the, the false detections were only in a small percentage, you know, not a small percentage, but a minority of people, a third, 35% or so. So for most people, this could be good. So it's one, another way of looking at detecting tonic-clonic seizures. But again, to show you the picture, they got to wear this device. It's better on the biceps than the forearm. And 9% of people who were in the study actually withdrew because they found it irritating. So what else could we do that might be even better or different, or at least as good, that maybe would be better tolerated? So there are wearable devices in a wristband. So there's a company called Empatica that makes a specialized device that's kind of like a smartwatch. It comes in multiple fashion colors. On the other hand, you can use your Apple Watch or your Samsung or other Android smartwatches and download an app. There's a, a smart smart monitor smartwatch. Inspire has an app on Samsung or Apple watches and Apple has a, another one. And, and there are a couple of companies doing this where you download the app and then the app detects if you're shaking. And how do these apps do it? They do it by using some of the other techniques. So these devices on your wrist can detect shaking by that accelerometer, it detects acceleration, so it detects the shaking. You don't really have a whole lot of muscle around your wrist and it's not tightly applied, it won't pick up the muscle, but it will pick up that acceleration back and forth 
And if it's a pattern that's characteristically seen during a seizure, just like that muscle activity that I showed you has characteristic seizure patterns, this it, accelerometry does. It can detect changes in heart rate, for example. It can look at that galvanic skin resistance, like in a lie detector test, and see if that changes as well. It can, some of them can detect other kinds of changes. So uh, you can detect seizures that way. So for example, with the uh, embrace, the empathic embrace, using just accelerometer and electrodermal, like the lie detector test, 94.6%. So about 95% of seizures are picked up of the tonic-clonic type, the grand mal, not the other kinds, just the violent shaking ones. But 95% are picked up, that's quite good. And there's no skin irritation. The false positive is down now to about 0.2 per day. So that means one every five days or about six a month. Again, if you have a seizure every few months, you might be having 20 or 30 alarms for every true seizure. But, but what? But again, depending upon the circumstance, some people have no false detections or very few. So in some people, it's not much of an issue or no issue at all. And depending upon what you do with it, you may be able to accommodate it. And how do these devices work in the end? They'll send an alarm. So the Empatica does it, the SPIAC does it, the other one does, they'll send an alarm, they'll send a text message, make a phone call, send an email to whoever you tell it to. So you program it to send a text message. So if somebody, if I had, you know, my son lives in a, it has a different household in the city. If he lived alone, uh, I could have him wearing this at home. If the alarm goes off, I pick up my phone, call, call my son. If he answers the phone, I just say, okay, Brian, false alarm, glad you're fine, how are you? And, and that's that. If he doesn't answer the phone, I can then call 911 and get an ambulance to him if I need. So if, I live, if my son lived in my house but was down the hall, he could be in his bedroom with the door closed doing whatever. I'm, on, you know, I'm in my bedroom or I'm downstairs and I get a warning, I can run around in the system. So you can use these this way. And I think probably the wrist monitors are the best because they also have you know, other functions built in them. They'll count steps, they, they can measure your heart rate, uh, they'll keep them there a watch. They'll tell you what time it is. Uh, if you weren't using an Apple watch or a Samsung or one of those other things, obviously it has full functionality built into it. So you can do that. Uh, the false alarm rate is significant and the really low ones, 0.2 per day, are generally people at rest. Well, up and about, it can be as high as one or two per day, which again gets to be a problem. So the, the challenge really is to minimize this, the far the false alarm rate. So that way it's useful for people who have infrequent seizures. What other techniques can we use? And then I'll wrap up. Uh, there are EEG systems. This is on the left is a research EEG device. Unless you're going to a Halloween party or belong to a very unusual group of people, you're probably not gonna be willing to wear something like this on a regular basis. It's a bit too obtrusive. On the other hand, the device on the right, and these are still research devices, people working on it, looks like a hearing aid and it sits in the ear and it's not really noticeable, especially if you have long hair, it's not noticeable at all. And then you can record EEGs and potentially detect seizures. These need to be tested. This is coming down the pike. So I'm telling you this because you know, this is what we'll be looking for in the future. Another method that we can use is video detection. And we're currently testing this at Jefferson. There's a company in Finland, and there's actually a second one in, in the Netherlands, but I'm, I'm, I'm actually working with it. We're a major development site with them in Finland to use a device. So this is a camera, it's a 3D camera. It, it only costs about $200 if it be bought off the shelf. They monitor it because it can be installed in a hospital or at home. And you can monitor people for extended periods of time. So it records video and audio. It sends the data up to the cloud and then a computer analyzes and say, is this pattern a seizure or not? And what does it look at? Well, it can look at various features. So it can look at the audio levels. There are often ch changes in sound that happen when people have seizures. It can look at different characteristics of motions, oscillations, and look at breathing, oscillations related to heart rate, the sound profile, orientations of posture, the hand, facial analysis, and pose. And I'll show you an example now. So here you see on the left, this is a pose estimation. So this is one of the things that's done, again, automatically by computer, where you can monitor people and then you know what's normal and what happens differently during a seizure. And if the pose estimation says, aha, this is different, then you know it's a seizure perhaps. And they can also pick up, here's somebody lying in bed. This device is good enough to pick up respiration. And you can see suddenly does respiration stop? Does someone stop breathing? Does the respiration rate change to look like a seizure? It can actually detect your, your 
pulse. Uh, so it'll detect changes in, pul in, 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 in pulse too. So your heart rate suddenly goes up, which happens during a seizure, or for it were it to go down, which it could rarely do, it would detect it too. So one of the thoughts is that this is not only good for tonic-clonic seizures, for the grand mal seizures, but this could be used for any seizure type. So we're, we're now using this alongside our routine monitoring in the hospital at Jefferson to have the device learn what all kinds of seizures look like. And once we know what they look like, then we could send it home. And this is something you could put in your bedroom at night, for example, you could have it in, a, in the house during the day and it, it watches you. Again, it feels a little invasive, but nobody's watching. It's going up to the cloud and computers analyzing it. No, no human is, is, is seeing it, but it can then do that and, tr and, and track and let us know whether you're having seizures or not. And the company's working on building an alarm into it too. So it potentially could have an alarm. Therapeutic devices, briefly, we can use seizure detection in therapeutic devices. The device here on the right, in what panel A, is the responsive neurostimulation device made by Neuropace. It detects the seizure through these electrodes in the brain and through the computer chip, and then it delivers a little jolt of electricity to the brain to try to suppress the seizure. And this below this graph is an example of sort of seizure activity coming on, electrical stimulation, and then it stops. Uh, a lot of what it stimulates, in fact, is not seizure, it stimulates other things and appears to help. But again, this, it's a responsive device and you can figure where this you know, could, could work. So it helps abort seizures if they've started. If it detects activity that might be heralding a seizure, it might be able to stimulate and prevent that seizure from starting. You know, another approach is, uh, in addition to this transcranial, this is another device for treatment where some people are now investigating rather than putting electrodes in the brain like the responsive nerve stimulation, we put electrodes on the outside, run some current through at a comfortable level that's not painful, and maybe this alters your ability to have seizures. It may reduce it. Uh, this is the VNS, vagus nerve stimulation, so an external device that doesn't have to be implanted to test. It's being investigated for epilepsy. And the current implanted VNS device, so the vagus nerve stimulator that goes inside under the skin, and runs a wire up to the neck, has a heart rate detection. So they're using heart rate change as a surrogate for seizures. If your heart rate suddenly goes up, the device goes off to try to abort it. Uh, so again, you, not only can, can you look at shake, shaking for alarming, but you can look at heart rate change and maybe trigger something therapeutic to break a, to block a seizure. What are some other things that I hope will be coming down the pike? And I was doing a little research along these lines. And then unfortunately we ran out of funding and had to uh, had to stop it and it was, it was getting to be challenging. It really takes a big company, I think, to do it or uh, consider more effort. But the woman on the left here is wearing a bicycle helmet. So everybody thinks about a bike helmet as this thing that goes on your head. They're selling these in Europe now. They're starting to be sold in the US. They're about $300, I understand. So they're not cheap, but it's just an inflatable device that it detects if you're propelled forward and falling, it inflates like this. So it shoots up, inflates, protects your head, and then it deflates. So this is the modern bike helmet and it's got smart sensor technology to detect that your head is being flung forward and going down. On the right is a vest worn by motorcyclists. So this is a, a motorcycle guy and this black vest that he's wearing detects him being thrown from the motorcycle and it inflates. It's basically a portable airbag. They make these for skiers as well. And I see no reason why Scientists couldn't develop techniques, and this is what we were working on. I was collaborating with somebody at Drexel, uh, where you have a device that detects your falling, you're starting to fall. And, he, and the, the, the professor at Drexel and I were working on a project, actually for anybody, just for old, older people or younger people who are at risk for falling, that it would detect your falling and going down, and maybe it would detect that your head's lower than your hip, but it has to be moving at a certain rate so it just doesn't go off when you bend, when you bend down to tie your shoes or take off your socks or put on your socks but it detects that you're falling, maybe it picks up a change in heart rate or something else or shaking, and then it deploys this airbag which blows up around your body and, and around your head and protects you. And, and this also even has a little metal post that shoots up behind the neck, uh, so it keeps you from breaking your neck to protect the neck as well. So it can protect your head, your neck, and, and your body. So cyclists can now wear this, skiers wear this, and again, it detects that, whoops, wrong position, sudden acceleration, airbag goes off and protects people. Any of you who want, just go onto YouTube at some point and type skiing airbag protector or motorcycle airbag protector, and you'll be able to see some videos that show you how this works. They're kind of fun to watch. I should, should have incorporated one into this talk. So what do we need? 
we need a way so that if we have devices, that people will want to use them, right? So it can't be burdensome for people with seizures. If it's burdensome to use, people won't use it. They have to be unobtrusive. Nobody is going to walk around, you know, wearing a giant vest like this all the time and a helmet to protect him. Uh, this, yeah, I don't know. It's a little, you know, somebody might. But, you know, and, and again, just to, to go back to the ridiculous, nobody's going to wear this on their head, right? Whereas an ear thing like that might work. So it has to be unobtrusive, it has to be reliable and have a low false positive rate. And then if we have reliable detection, we can have interventions. Again, we can't have you wear that airbag and just have an airbag blowing up on your body once a day because the device thinks you're having a seizure when you're not, right? You can have that EMG say the muscle activity looks like a seizure, boom, airbag goes off. Not helpful having an airbag explode every day when you're not having a seizure. So we need reliable detection. We live in an exciting time. If you think about it, only a little over 100 years ago, in 1903, at the end of the year, the Wright brothers got their first flight. Their first flight was actually only 12 seconds. It was the fourth flight of the day that they stayed up for 59 seconds. And they, they went a, a, a fraction of a mile, less than a mile. You know, less than 100 years later, you know, we can go 18,000 kilometers. That's nearly 10,000 miles. 19 hours of flying time from Singapore to New York or Australia to London. Uh, our only limiting factors are imagination and willingness to try something new. And I think we have to be aware that the early versions may not work well. None of us are getting up on this. Uh, the Wright brothers had a bunch of crashes along the way and many of the early flyers were in crashes and they were, you know, it didn't work so well, but we stuck with it. And now airplanes are the safest means of transportation of all. So I think we have to Keep at it, keep experimenting, keep working, and hopefully success will come. And I will end here and open for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sperling. That was very insightful. Um, now, Rena is going to take over for the questions and she'll be posing them to you shortly. Okay, we have a question here. Is there a recommended device to detect nocturnal non-convulsive seizures with status epilepticus? Is there a device to detect non-convulsive seizures or status? No, the devices only at present detect tonic-clonic or convulsive seizures. So what we're working on with this video device is to detect that. The accelerometry, the wristbands, you have to have shaking in a certain way to do it and these do not and the present devices don't. So it's hopeful video will. Now it may be that the wristband, if it can detect oxygen levels, for example, changes in oxygen levels, changes in electrodermal activity or patterns of breathing that they will be able to do so at some point. But uh, right now, this is a real gap that needs to be, needs to be filled. Uh, the seizures, however, which are most dangerous and riskiest are the tonic-clonic seizures. Those are the ones that are most likely to cause injury you crash to the ground and can hurt yourself with those. Those are the ones most often, unfortunately, associated with the unfortunate of SUDEP, the sudden unexpected death and epilepsy. Uh, tonic-clonic seizures are bad. You don't want tonic-clonic. We want to be able to detect them. We want to be able to intervene. So they're the most important, but we've got to get the others because lots of other seizures are bad too. Thank you. Another question is, does TDCS help? And what success rate or research has been uh, done using this device? So that's the, uh, the TCDS, the transcranial direct current stimulation. Does it work? I don't know yet. There, there have been a, a number of papers published suggesting that it provides some help. The quality of those is such that none of us would recommend it yet. More research must be done. Uh, it sort of makes sense a little bit uh, that it might work, uh, but a lot of, a lot of, what's involved with it doesn't make sense. And this is one of those examples where you take, you know, you find papers, they've got a few patients, they have five patients, 10 patients, they put current, people feel the electricity coursing through their head, and then they think they're, they say they're better, but you need a placebo control group because we know when you just do things, 20 or 25% of people may respond. And especially if it's, a, if it's a more aggressive thing like surgery, a third of people respond to placebo. So it could very easily be the placebo effect. Now, from my perspective, you know, if you respond to a placebo, but you respond, I'm happy, I suppose. But to say that it's an effective therapy and having somebody charge a lot of money for something that's bogus fundamentally bothers me. 
so I, I think we need good data because the concern is that people will go to that rather than something that's more effective, that is a proven effectiveness. So it's good to try new things, but I think the new things have to be done in the context of a proper controlled trial, a scientific trial, uh, so you can really know that it works because sometimes these things can be harmful. And, you know, here's a perfect example, the COVID epidemic, there was a lot of hype over this uh, drug hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine that's used to treat malaria and hydroxychloroquine that's used to treat lupus that it would help people with COVID. There were a couple of small studies out of China and France that suggested it might work. Uh, and then it was hyped tremendously. And then the FDA, stupidly in my view, I think in the view of most, most, most physicians and scientists, gave emergency authorizations and then tens of thousands of people were getting this drug. And it turned out in proper studies, it actually didn't work and it posed greater risk. There were, there were actually problems. There were side effects were, were severe that people were having cardiac rhythm problems. And most importantly, they were getting that instead of potentially something else that might have been better. So, and then the FDA finally pulled it back, and you know it was approved. Uh, you know, I think everybody was afraid and desperate. There's nothing that works. Why not try it? Why not give it a shot? But in fact, they gave it a shot, and it caused more harm than good. So, for these kinds of devices too, we want to make sure they don't cause harm. It's very important. Uh, you know, there's some things that you don't have to do a test. Uh, uh, if you jump out of an airplane at 10,000 feet and don't have a parachute, you know nothing good's going to happen. If you were to put a parachute on, you know, you, you only need two people to jump out of a plane at 10,000 feet with a parachute to know that it works. It doesn't take a whole lot of science. But these ambiguous situations where a lot of people ultimately get better and some don't, it, you, know, you really need, you need a proper scientific testing. Thank you. Um, another question, um, first it has a little backstory, but it says, my sister has seizures in her sleep and she's been falling and she gets bruises and marks all over her body. Can that helmet and neck uh, detector help protect her? I, I wouldn't use a helmet and anything like that in sleep that could cause a problem. What you might want to do, frankly, is this is be very practical. If she's having it in bed, make sure that there's no night table right next to the, right next to the bed. So there's nothing to bang her head on that's hard. You could not use uh, a frame for the bed, but put the mattress right on the floor so she doesn't have very far to fall. I mean, you could use a mattress. You don't even need a box spring if you put the mattress right on the floor. And then a mattress is anywhere between 12 and 15 inches in depth. You're not going to fall very far with that. You could put padding beside the bed as well on the floor. You could put you know, exercise pads or other kinds of soft foam material. Uh, nothing you'd sink in too much that would potentially block block breathing, uh, but you could put soft things there. So you, you have to think about it practically. The best thing to protect her is to be proactive. Get rid of hard surfaces, have the bed low next to the floor, have pads on it beside it. And uh, But then what could you do if she had one of these seizure detectors that could send a message to somebody who ideally lived with her, that person would then know and go in the room. And you know, you know, arguably you could hear it, so you could put a baby monitor and hear it. That's a little more invasive because then you're hearing everything that goes on at night, you know, uh, the, uh, to hear, you know, as opposed to wearing one of those wristband detectors or the EMG detectors that then sends an alert during sleep that a seizure has happened, then you can run in the room and help, help keep that person safe. But I think that's exactly the sort of thing to do. Preventative measures, think about what can I do to make this environment safe? Just like I tell a lot of my patients who have tonic clonic seizures at different times during the day, get a padded toilet seat for the bathroom. The bathroom is the worst room in the house it's all, for all the hard surfaces. And there's glass in a lot of bathrooms. Toilet seat can be padded comfortably. You could put a piece of foam on the lip of the tub, right? It softens it a little bit. You could have a rug and some uh, soft material on, a, instead, on the tile floor so it's not quite as hard. So there are different things you can do to try to make it soft. You could you know, not have tile on the walls. It costs more money, but wallboard is softer than tile if you fall and strike it. So you, you, you have to think about what you can do preventatively as well. Wonderful, thank you. And our last question here, um, does having too many grand malls cause a lot of brain damage? Great question. There's some evidence that continued seizures cause brain damage and the best evidence is for grand malls or tonic-clonic seizures that they cause brain damage. That when you have grand malls, they cause permanent injury and maybe a, you lose a few cells in your brain with each one or more than a few cells. And they also can alter the, some of the connections so that rather than cells communicating with each other in certain ways, it can alter the pathway that signals take. 
and that that then can lead to changes in memory, changes in mood and the like. So you, you, your cognitive function is not good. So yes, they not only do they cause injury and have, have risk for the ultimate complication, uh, but they can certainly cause significant problem. There are published studies showing that over the course of time, the brain shrinks more in people with grand mal than people without grand mal in certain regions. So that again goes to killing cells during seizures. So this is why some of my patients are on this session I know now, uh, or their relatives. This is why I'm always aggressive about, let's do whatever it takes to stop the seizures. Seizures are, are not good. Milder seizures, are milder, but they still cause problems, and especially the big seizures, the tonic-clonic or grand mal seizures, cause significant brain injury, potential for bodily injury. And things that sound scary, like brain surgery, are safer than having uncontrolled seizures. It is safer to have surgery than it is to have seizures. The morning you're in the operating room, your risk is a little higher than if you weren't, but over just a year or two or three, it's, it's, it's safer to have more aggressive treatment if need be to try to really suppress the seizures. And ideally, I'm a neurologist, I'd rather do it with pills. But if pills don't work, that's when you think about other techniques. Thank you. All right, one more question just squeezed in and then we'll move on to our next speaker. But does RTMS help? Okay, so that's repetitive uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. So that's analogous to the direct current stimulation of the brain. So basically, magnetism and electricity are two faces of the same thing. Uh, the magnetic field is simply 90 degrees off. It's orthogonal to an electric field. Uh, so does that help? And the answer is the same as the direct current stimulation. There are a few papers published suggesting the possibility of benefit. No good quality studies showing that it really works. Uh, and the effects shown in the, in, in the preliminary studies are, 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 are relatively modest in my view. So again, it would be great if we had something, you know, something easy like that where you could hold the device over your head for a few minutes, once or twice a day, and it just altered the way your brain functions. So you're less likely to have seizures. So it's worth investigating. If you know people who are doing electric, who are doing scientific studies for this and want you to participate in the trial, I would suggest you think carefully about volunteering. And, I, and, and if it seems right for you, volunteer. The way we're going to make the treatment better is by having people participate in these studies, so we know whether or not they work. Uh, right now. There's a reason that nobody prescribes these treatments because they're, they're still unproven. Thank you so much, Dr. Sperling. We Re really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thank you. I apologize. I ran a little late. I'm sorry. Um, you're okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Rena Lachlan. I'm the program director for the EFEPA, in case you don't know me. And I have the pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Erin Esposito. She is a licensed psychologist and current neuropsychology fellow in the neurology department at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Neuropsychology is a field that focuses on the relationship between the brain and behavior. Throughout her training, Dr. Esposito has worked in a variety of hospital settings. A major focus of her current training is the epilepsy program at Penn. Activities include conducting evaluations with individuals prior to and following surgery for epilepsy, attending a multidisciplinary surgical conference, and presenting patient data, and performing evaluations for people with epilepsy who are noticing cognitive changes. Her experience also includes participation in the WADA test for language and memory lateralization prior to epilepsy surgery. She is interested in working with individuals with epilepsy and their families and assisting them in identifying useful resources to improve their quality of life. Thank you so much, Dr. Esposito. It's all yours. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. I'm just going to pull my screen up then. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, and I just want to thank everybody from the Epilepsy Foundation for having me. And thank you for everybody who's attending. And Dr. Sterling, that was a wonderful presentation. So nice to be able to follow that. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to go over the agenda of what I'm going to talk about today. I was asked to talk about the cognitive and behavioral issues in epilepsy. So first, I'm going to touch a little bit on the cognitive issues. Then I'll touch a little bit on behavior. And then kind of in psychology, cognition, mood, and behavior all kind of get melded together to make some changes. So I'm also going to touch about mood and some common psychiatric disorders seen with seizures. 
Um, I'm going to briefly then talk about some medication effects that people have noticed with cognitive and behavioral changes, and then just briefly touch on treatment again. So the first thing I have up here is just a definition of cognition. It's a little bit long, but essentially um, cognition encompasses a variety of thinking skills. And this impacts a person's ability to navigate problems, to manage their behaviors, and really to function independently. Um, you can see that there's several types of epilepsies that um, people noticed uh, cognitive changes from and cognitive impairments. Um, so impairments in epilepsy, they come from a variety of factors. Some of them are from um, these, what they considered, uh, what one study considered more permanent factors. So um, like your traumas, hypoxic events where you lose um, oxygen, genetic disorders. Some people might um, have heard someone say this from their own diagnosis, like mesial temporal sclerosis or status epilepticus, which I believe was mentioned a little bit earlier, and just malformations of the brain. Um, the severity of the cognitive and behavioral changes is thought to be related to the severity of these causes. Um, these are generally stable although some can be changed. And then other types of factors are considered to be more dynamic. So um, the seizures themselves, um, abnormalities related to the seizure activities and AED use. And um, as Dr. Sterling already mentioned, if you can find and treat the cause of the epilepsy, some of these cognitive and behavioral deficits can improve. So it is very important. So on the next slide, I'm going to touch a little bit about um, what I do day to day. So I um, do neuropsychological evaluations with people. So um, in your general neuropsychological evaluation, we look at different cognitive domains. So I'm briefly going to touch on, you know, if you would be referred for this type of evaluation, I'm going to touch on the types of domains and then some common problems that would be seen in people with epilepsy. So the first one is a big one, it's uh, learning and memory. So memory is a, a complex process and you can see problems with learning at memory in various stages. Um, some people have trouble getting the information in and other people have problems retaining the information once they get it in. Some people have problems with both. It's hard for me to get the information in and then it's hard for me to, and then I lose what I do get in over time. Um, some people will find that recognition cues help, other, for other people that won't be helpful. So there's a lot of variability within the problems that people can experience in learning and memory. Um, so people with epilepsy will have problems once they're having active seizures, just laying down memories. So they might, you know, problems that might come, you might come in, you might complain of, oh, my short-term memory isn't very good. That's what a lot of people, patients will come in and say. Um, also, people with epilepsy will... Uh, complain of problems, you know, I can't remember things from the past or, you know, events or personal information. Um, memory deficits are one of the most common deficits seen in epilepsy, and sometimes they're considered to be the most impairing for people. Um, so a typical evaluation that we would do would look at visual and verbal information, um, and depending on what type of seizures you're having, um, you may, or where your seizures are originating from, you may see differences in one type of memory may be weaker than the other. Um, in general, we do these type of evaluations to see if the data kind of fits in line with your other studies. Um, and then language is the next domain I'm going to cover. Um, so this includes your word knowledge, your ability to express yourself through speech, your understanding of language, those types of things. So a lot of times people with epilepsy, they can experience aphasia um, during a seizure. Um, and a family member might also notice that, you know, during that time, they couldn't understand their speech. Um, but then some, sometimes people also experience more long-standing problems with speech. Um, so they might substitute one word for another. They'll say, well, I say chair instead of table. And that's, these are called semantic paraphrasic errors when they're in the same category. Um, and also they, people might substitute words that sound the same. So like cane for car. So they have similar beginning sounds. Um, and those would be phonemic paraphrasic errors. Um, other people might report difficulties with finding words, remembering names, or just generally communicating in conversation. Um, the next domain is its visual spatial skills. So um, that's basically your ability to perceive visual stimuli, um, to perceive things spatially. And then, you know, once you are perceiving it, to then take it and construct it, the visual construction aspect of that. Um, so common complaints that people will experience would be just getting lost, 
um, due to difficulty with navigation or just, you know, depending on where your seizures are coming from, people might say, well, I have difficulty remembering people's faces, that type of thing. Um, so there was um, a rat study done and they found that rats lost proficiency on um, spatial tasks when seizures occurred for 11 days straight. Um, the rats did eventually return to um, baseline following a 10 day recovery period, but they had kind of suggested that when you're having these ongoing seizures, your cognition is constantly disrupted. So again, that, that kind of reiterates that the treatment of the seizures is very important for ongoing cognitive functioning. Um, the next, uh, the next domain is the general intellectual functioning and academic functioning. So this one is common. Um, this is where you get the IQ score and then when, when you look at the general intellectual functioning and that's used to diagnose intellectual disability and a lot of other learning disabilities, different things like that. So people are generally familiar with at least the concept of these tests and they look at just core visual verbal skills and processing speed and working memory, which I'll talk about after that. And then um, the academic skills, they kind of look for the presence of early learning difficulties or kind of where people were at at baseline to see um, if anything else is going on that could be comorbid to epilepsy as well. Um, the attention and working memory is another big one. So there's a lot of um, different types of attention. Um, we typically think of sustained attention when we think of attention. So your ability to just look, um, look at something and then focus on it. Um, without getting distracted. Um, then there is also um, alternating attention, which is your ability to switch from one task to another and then be able to go back to the prior task, um, which is similar to working memory, which is your ability to take information and mentally manipulate that in some way. So that might be when, you know, if you go to the doctor's office and they say, subtract, you know, seven from 100 and then keep subtracting seven. So instead of you just, you know, hearing it and spitting it back out, it's your ability to do something with that information. So this poor attention and working memory is often seen in individuals with epilepsy as a result of the seizures. Um, processing speed is the next domain and that is how quickly a person is able to take in information and perform tasks. Um, with um, anti-epileptic drugs, people often experience slowed processing speed and multiple anti-epileptic drugs is typically associated with slower processing speed. The next domain is, is very complicated. It's executive functioning. Uh, it's a complex term that encompasses a variety of cognitive and behavioral responses, including mental flexibility, planning and organizing, behavioral inhibition. So the ability to take in the environmental feedback and use it in a meaningful way. Uh, individuals with executive functioning difficulties might present as concrete. Sometimes they might have difficulty kind of getting the point in social situations. Uh, this it can be difficult um, for them in deciding what's important in the environment, how to make a plan, and kind of execute that plan, and it, which makes everyday life very challenging. Um, in addition, they might have trouble discriminating what's in the most important information. So you know, you might say, "Oh, they're not." remembering things, but they're not really even able to figure out what the most important information is to take from their environment to remember. So sometimes, usually there can be comorbid memory problems as well, but sometimes this makes memory less efficient. Um, I can also be accessible with, uh, with behavioral disturbances, which I'm gonna touch on later. Um, and executive functioning is typically associated with the frontal lobes, but it can also be seen with global difficulties in functioning as well. And then the last one is motor functioning. So we typically look at motor strength, dexterity, speed um, at, on through both hands. And if one hand is significantly slower than the other in the absence of other injuries or contributory factors, it's typically associated with the opposite side of, of the brain. Again, uh, general slowness can also be seen with anti-epileptic drugs. But here's a, just a little bit more about cognition. So. Um, among the comorbidities associated with epilepsy, cognitive and behavioral abnormalities are considered the most severe, or are most can sometimes considered the most severe. So many people and their families consider them um, to be at least as troubling as the seizures themselves. And you'll see um, it, uh, down here I have on that third one, you know, all of these other disorders that it can cause cognitively. 
And then at the end, there's this childhood out onset epilepsy may not meet the same outcomes as peers. So for people with regard to school employment, marriage, parenting. So functionally, that's huge. And again, with the social independence as is on top. Um, and about a quarter of the children with epilepsy meet criteria for intellectual disability. So next I'm gonna move on just to some behavioral issues in epilepsy. Um, I liked that definition of behavior. It says anything an organism does involving an action or response to simulation. There are multiple factors that can, uh, that go into behavior. So kind of uh, internally what's going on to so your physical state, uh, anything that could be going, you're not feeling well, something going on medically, your mood, your cognitive capabilities, those types of things, or externally, what's going on in the environment. So who's around you? What resources you have? Or is something stressful going on? Um, so your brain controls a lot of these different things, you, you, like your emotions, your impulse control and behavioral responses like I have there. So disruption can make things difficult. Um, and sometimes this is kind of broader looking at you know cognitive and, and mood and a lot of other symptoms but sometimes these behavioral changes that we see can occur exclusively during a seizure or immediately following a seizure like you'll notice a change in your speech or your memory or something like that and um sometimes they will or something like anxiety or seeing things that aren't there but other things other cognitive or behavioral changes they might be more long-standing as a result of a seizure or other comorbid disorder. So um, some changes in your mood, like depression might end up being more long-standing, which will cause some behavioral consequences, which I'm gonna talk about later. Um, so then what I'm gonna touch on now is behavioral um, behavior and executive functioning. So in addition to the cognitive deficits associated with executive functioning, there are several emotional and behavioral deficits that can be present with epilepsy. Um, so one thing is that apathy or lack of initiation. So kind of when you think of somebody who would just, if you didn't tell them to do something, they would just sit or, you know, sit on the couch all day unless you told them, hey, it's time to get up. It's time to do something. Um, these individuals are typically better when their environment is structured than when they have to spontaneously adapt or change to their environment. Uh, they associate Beha uh, behavioral problems and executive functioning to higher levels of aggression. Many cognitive processes that, that can be impaired, such as that impulse control, um, planning, organizing, be able to integrate the information and turn it into something meaningful in a social situation is impaired with executive functioning. So um, some people are perceiving that the aggression could be um, due to the difficulties with executive functioning and also on the difficulty controlling how the changing mood states are expressed behaviorally. So with regard to mood, I'm gonna now touch on mood because mood impacts a lot of behavior and different changes. So I liked these definitions of mood too. They're a little, they're a little long, but the take home is that, um, that mood states are variable and unpredictable. Um, they're particularly challenging when individuals have, um, because individuals can have difficulty controlling their mood for a variety of factors, including cognitive factors, like we just touched on the executive dysfunctioning, medical factors such as the epilepsy, genetic predisposition to some mood or other, other psychiatric disorder or lack of environmental support. Um, so I, I, again, at that bottom, this second from the bottom, it's talking about some people might know what causes them to feel a certain emotion and other times, it's not really directly linked to a situation or event. So this is problematic for people when they're not sure, you know, what is gonna trigger their mood and how that's gonna impact their functioning day to day. So over the lifetime, individuals with epilepsy are more likely to experience depression, anxiety, and suicidal ideation, and they also have pain and trouble sleeping. Um, these symptoms impact a person's quality of life and can lead to difficulties with independent functioning at work, school, et cetera. Um, so it's important to, to assess for and treat these disorders. Um, so one of the, um, the difficulties um, that people experience with epilepsy is depression. So it's typically characterized by those feelings of sadness, emptiness, and irritability. So it can cause physical symptoms, weight loss or gain, feelings of restlessness, being, feelings of being slowed down, fatigue, low energy, difficulty sleeping. Um, and difficulties with thinking, 
concentration and indecisiveness. So again, uh, not only does epilepsy cause cognitive side side effects essentially, but so does depression. So it, it can be complicated if you have epilepsy. Um, it's important to treat the seizures, but it's also important to treat some of these other disorders because they can cause other problems and they're, they're somewhat more interconnected than these little categories that I've put them in. Um, and you can see that the, the one study found that depression um, prevalence was from 11 to 62% in epilepsy, which is high. Um, depression impacts a lot of, is impacted by neurobiological processes, the so psychosocial environment, uh, epilepsy specific features, you know, certain types of epilepsy, just where they are in the brain and treatments for epilepsy. Um, additional factors for depression include family history, perception of control over the seizures, and just the person's overall coping skills. Um, again, depression's linked to the to poor quality of life. And I think we've talked about that in a couple of the disorders. Um, so depression can occur before, during, or after seizures. Most commonly it's occurring between seizures. Um, and the second most common is following a seizure. Um, depression could be a risk factor for developing epilepsy. And then down here, when they're talking about the, um, the AEDs can exacerbate or cause depressive symptoms, the adverse effects of AEDs can overlap with depression. So it, it is confusing. You do need to, uh, if you're experiencing some of these symptoms, you need to make sure you're working with your medical professional to kind of determine what you know, what the cause is and what the best treatment for you is. But um, some of the symptoms overlap, including fatigue, sleep disturbance, weight gain, memory disturbance. So the next, um, the next disorder is anxiety. So anxiety isn't considered a mood disorder. It's considered an anxiety disorder. So these next couple are not mood disorders. They're, um, they're in their own category. But anxiety is an excessive fear and anticipation of a future event. Um, so people with anxiety disorders often experience fear, avoidance, and distressing thoughts or belief. Um, typically, people can see anxiety as an aura for epilepsy, um, especially people with temporal lobe epilepsy, and that's just due to biological mechanisms. And epilepsy, uh, a reaction to epilepsy can also cause anxiety. Uh, people are often afraid of the seizures that they're having. Um, they might be afraid that they're gonna have a seizure and not know when or where they're gonna have the seizure. And they also might fear, you know, what's gonna happen if people see me see, have a seizure? Am I gonna be embarrassed? Am I gonna be able to get what I need? And there's a lot of anxiety and shame and fear associated with that. Um, anxiety might lead to poor medication compliance, which is gonna further exacerbate your seizures. Um, so this is just a study, um, estimated the prevalence of anxiety disorders and epilepsy, and they um, consider it to be 22.8% across the light span. Uh, they often report AED side effects and reduced quality of life, increased risk for suicide. Um, so this study is just finding that depression, AED side effects, smoking, illicit drug use, uh, all caused a higher risk for anxiety. Um, and the level of disability with seizures was increased with people with anxiety. And for that study, higher education was actually found to be a protective factor for that. And um, the next one I'm going to talk about is it's psychotic spectrum disorders. So I'm just going to touch a little bit, just explain, they're very complicated. And I'm just going to explain a little bit about what some of these things are, then just um, relate them to epilepsy. Um, sick features. Um, of psychotic spectrum disorders. So delusions are these fixed beliefs that don't change despite conflicting evidence. So a common delusion that you might see is someone's a little bit paranoid and they think that they're being followed by someone, specifically the police um, is a big one or someone outside themselves is controlling them. Um, they're considered bizarre when they're not plausible or, under, or they don't really make sense in the context of everyday events. Um, so that is a big one. One that I think has a big overlap with seizures are these hallucination, hallucinations. Um, auditory hallucinations are the most common in schizophrenia related disorders. Generally in schizophrenia, you'll hear people saying that you, they're hearing voices. And sometimes again, like I said, the voices are telling them to do things, these, which they call these command hallucinations. In epilepsy, people sometimes see, have what are get characterized as hallucinations 
essentially is auras. So they might hear a song or smell something or see something or hear something, but it's a little bit different from this one that's considered um, in these in schizophrenia proper. Um, the next one is disorganized speech, and that's that's just inferred from talking to the individual. Um, individuals often will switch topics and they don't respond to the questions appropriately. In some cases, it it does mimic an aphasia in some rare and extreme cases. So just again, you know, it's it's a different presentation. There's a specific way that it looks. So that's why you need to make sure, you know, you, you're talking with somebody like one of your treatment providers because aphasia is common in epilepsy. Individuals with memory impairments might not respond to um, questions appropriately. People with difficulty with executive functioning, they might not be able to follow the conversation. So you're not responding to the questions appropriately, but it's not as a result of these symptoms. Um, the next one is disorganized or abnormal motor behavior. Um, so basically there can be some stereotype movements like staring, grimacing, just not talking, echoing of speech. Um, and there is a catatonic behavior where it's just a decrease in reactivity to the environment at all. They resist instructions. They might have a bizarre posture here that they're kept for a long time, lack of verbal or motor response. Um, there's motor symptoms seen in epilepsy, but again, it's, it's different from this. Um, and negative symptoms are of psychotic spectrum disorders are most commonly seen in schizophrenia over other psychotic spectrum disorders. Um, so this, um, this is this reduced emotion, lack of eye contact. Sometimes their speech tone becomes unusual. There's a decrease in motivation or purposeful activities. Um, so decreased speech output, decreased pleasure, that type of thing. Lack of interest in social interactions. The negative symptoms typically associated with schizophrenia aren't typically seen in the reports of um, psychosis in epilepsy. Um, the one study just stated that there's not that lack of affect or a social withdrawal attitude seen. So for whatever reason, patients are at a higher risk, it wasn't clear, for having psychotic symptoms, and those who experience a psychosis are at a higher risk for epilepsy. Um, they've seen focal epilepsy in the frontal and temporal lobes, commonly seen with psychosis. Um, psychosis has been documented to occur during or after seizure or following a temporal lobectomy. Those specific AEDs have, they've documented um, psychosis in those. And it was interesting, they did um, talk about this postictal psychosis. Um, and in one of the studies they talked about, you know, there was this lucid interval um, between kind of a normal mental state and then people experiencing some psychosis about 12 hours to up to seven days after, um, after the seizure. And what they were basically, the criteria was that they couldn't be having a seizure during that time. Um, and they were um, saying, usually for some, some of these disorders, you have to rule out a delirium or um, you know, some type of disorientation, but they were putting that in their diagnostic criteria. So the people who were um, establishing what they considered this post ictal psychosis. Um, but it couldn't be attributed to some, you know, other, um, other intoxication, anything like that. Um, and this is just a study that I'm going to review. Um, it, they talked about um, cognitive and behavioral effects of these drugs on pediatric epilepsy. So for the first medication, they found severe abnormal behaviors. Um, potentially related to the speed and introduction in 6% of children. So this is specific to children. Um, with lamotrigine, there was a reduction in aggression and impulsivity, um, and it was often used as a mood stabilizer for bipolar disorder, um, and also used to treat um, acute antidepressants, or and activity, sorry, and it reduces the brain excitability, which they thought was suppressing the mood orders. However, they saw an increase in patients with intellectual disability, which they thought was related to um, the increased alertness and self-assertion from that. Um, there was no significant um, cognitive effects seen in children, and they uh, some saw improvements in concentration. And then for Tobamax, 
it was associated with greater than 20% of children and adolescents experiencing cognitive effects. Um, side effects were seen even in people who didn't report the cognitive changes. Um, and it was in various cognitive domains. So we, like I've touched on some of them, attention, memory, processing speed, verbal fluency, and word finding. So these language executive tasks. Um, and they showed a larger deficit in verbal processing tasks uh, when compared to gabapentin. And with Topamax, when they looked at functional neuroimaging, they saw under activation of the whole brain, specifically in the language network, a common side effect that we've seen patients come in with is word finding difficulties with Topamax. Um, it was associated with psychomotor slowing. Uh, and then it was also associated with psychiatric symptoms, including depression, psych psychosis, and aggressive behavior. Um, but conversely, some studies found Topamax to be effective at managing depression, anger, and aggression. Um, the next one, uh, uh, it's Keppra. It's side effects in the pediatric population um, included somnolence, behavioral problems, irritability, abnormal behavior, um, hyperactivity, and aggression. Um, but they also showed uh, it to be positive with uh, when it was combined with another treatment, improving alertness and communication abilities. Um, Oxcazbazpine showed Im uh, improved performance on focused attention and increased manual um, writing speed without effects on long term memory. Um, and then zanisamide had severe negative consequences, including mania, suicidal ideation, psychosis, cognitive slowing, and language dysfunction. And after a year of monotherapy with just that medication, um, there was a significant decline in baseline performance on verbal fluency and attention. And just a couple more medications. So rafinamide, there were, they didn't see any negative effects um, on cognition or um, psychiatric um, symptoms. Um, the next one, they didn't, uh, the one study found improvement in processing speed. Uh, the next medication, no significant cognitive impairments. And the last one, negative consequences, including irritability, aggression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, and mood alteration, more frequent in adolescents than adults, taking high dosages, and somnolence was also reported. They also saw a cognitive slowing, irritability, and depression, and compared to co what, and other cognitive co uh, effects when compared to placebo. So this study just concluded that those two, lamotrigine and rufinamide, uh, had the best cognitive and behavioral outcomes for children with attentional and broader cognitive difficulties. I'm just going to try to wrap this up quickly. So um, this is just um, basically, this is looking at some interventions. So this is cognitive and behavioral interventions in epilepsy. So they're looking at multiple psychological treatments. And this is specifically looking at behavioral and mood disorders. And this is a little bit confusing. But when they're using that cognitive and behavioral intervention terms, they're looking at cognition by examining problematic thought patterns and how they relate to mood um, and not necessarily some of the deficits that we talked about earlier with the thinking. So they basically suggested that they're advantageous because they pose minimal risk of side effects, aren't associated with drug interactions, cost-effective, and can be conducted remotely. Um, so the most favorable outcomes were seen in the CBT-based approach. So CBT, again, it's, it looks at addressing, like, like I said, that cognitive piece is that negative thought and behavioral patterns. Um, and they're usually brief and targeted to a specific um, treatment area. Um, the other treatments that they, uh, that they talked about to be effective, like yoga, meditation, relaxation, biofeedback, those kind of integrate the mind-body experience and they look to, that, um, to change your physiological state. So you're kind of actively working to change your own physiological state to to create this sense of calm. So while they found those things to be the most effective, they did say that you needed to take into account um, the individual difference. They did look at this um, to see if, you know, reducing some of these impacts would reduce seizure um, activity, but they didn't find that. So they found that this would be helpful at reducing some of these mental health symptoms, and it's appropriate as an adjunct to the therapy, but it should not be used as a primary treatment. You still need to go to your doctor. You still need to take your medications. You still need to, you know, follow up with those recommended treatments from your physician. Um, and then the other thing that I didn't really discuss, speaking of the cognitive symptoms, is some people who are experiencing those impairments with memory 
um, uh, another levels of cognition, executive functioning, those types of things. There is cognitive rehabilitation therapy for them, usually through a speech therapist where you can work on strategies for everyday life. So like, it might be helpful for you to use kind of like what Dr. Sperling was talking about. If you needed help setting up the apps or what would work best for you in the context of some of the deficits you might have. Some people attend the sessions with their families and they can come up with a plan to work in the context of their cognitive symptoms to, um, to manage their day-to-day -day needs. And so just th these are just the closing remarks. So it's just a complex story. You, you need to really make sure, as I think I've said before, you work with your team. There's the, the Epilepsy Foundation is great. They had a lot of really great resources on their um, website and they're really easy to understand uh, language. So if you want to know more about some of the things I know I've touched briefly on a lot of different things, but if you want to know a little bit more, that was a great resource. And then it's more com some symptoms are more common in epilepsy and specific types, everybody's unique. So just, you need to kind of work with your team and find an individual plan. And then those are just the references that I had. And then I can stop sharing that. Thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry, this is an echo. Thank you so much. And we'll open this up to questions. There are a few so far. So Dr. Esposito, a uh, question is, if, if a child has seizure control from medication, can these cognitive issues be caused by the medication? And you kind of went into that. But if you wanted to talk a little bit about that. Sure. So I, it does depend on the, you know, sir, a lot of medications can have side effects. Um, some people will complain depending on what the medication is. Again, that would be something to talk with your doctor about um, to see, you know, sometimes the cost benefit ratio of it causes me these cognitive problems, but it's controlling my seizures, um, depending on what's kind of more impairing if something else would work for them. Um, specifically, like I did mention that processing speed is one that's, that's pretty big just in a lot of AED use. But if it's a specific problem, like I mentioned, Topamax or it's that Tumpiramate, has a lot of language based and memory problems, just different things like that, then you might want to say, hey, is there something better that we can try that would make, make, make him, him or her function better? Thank you. Okay, the next question is, um, how often do you recommend getting an updated neuropsych eval? My son is 10 and had an eval at five and a half years old. Should he be reevaluated? He has uncontrolled epilepsy, very frequent tonic clonics and intellectual disability. And I wonder if his IQ is now lower four and a half years later. So it could be that, I think again, those a lot of these um, decisions are, kind of based on a case by case basis. Um, if he was diagnosed with intellectual disability at that time, sometimes with these tests, um, it's difficult once somebody's at a lower level um, to really see meaningful changes if they're, um, if he was already assessed to be very low at that time. That being said, if there are changes, uh, specifically if he's 10 and he's going to school and he might need an IEP, um, those types of things, those accommodations in place, an updated evaluation might be valuable for that. Or if you're looking to change treatment, you know, if you're considering some different, you know, surgical intervention, something like that. Um, absolutely. So I would, that would be something I would discuss with your medical provider to see, because they would be the person who would put the referral into a, to a neuropsych service anyway, to see when they think that's appropriate. But in general, people with epilepsy um, do sometimes have their cognition reevaluated once there's a change in, in, in functioning or treatment or something like that. Great, thank you. Could you elaborate on um, depression being a risk factor for epilepsy? So that was just uh, one of the things I found in the article and I am, I, I do apologize. I'm not really sure what, why it is a risk factor. I just know that it, that it was labeled as risk factor. So I apologize for that. If I if I can find uh, more information about that, I will, I will look, I will look into that. But I, I I just think you know when they're looking to identify the risk, they just said you know these were one of the things that we found. But if I can find something else, I will contact Raina. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any research on Depakote in terms of pediatric epilepsy and how I guess affects cognition and behavior? So. You know what? That's a good question. I didn't specifically touch on Depakote, and I didn't really look into that specific medication. But I'm sure that would be something again that I would want to talk to you. Would want to talk to your physician about 
because if there is, you know, um, the research out there, they should, they're going to want to weigh the cost and benefits with your specific child situation. So I would definitely consult with your physician about that. Great. Thank you. Um, what about phenobarbital? Um, the same kind of, you know, to consult their doctor or do you have yeah, yeah, I would, I would consult, I would, especially with medications, because I'm actually not a medical doctor. So mm -hmm. I, I touched on medications, because I knew that was something that people were interested in. But uh, again, it would be best for you to talk to your doctor about your specific situation. Okay, thank you. Um, so someone wrote that their son was diagnosed with infantile spasms at nine months old, and was get, given ACTH, and he's been on Kepra since nine months of age. He's now 10 and still on Kepra. Um, he is a complex learner, not sure if there's research that goes to infancy and the long-term view of cognition and behavior and academic achievement in school. Um, please advise. So I think, um, you know, some of the studies were saying, I, you know, the, the earlier age of onset with epilepsy, um, the treatments for epilepsy, they can cause a variety of cognitive and behavioral issues. So again, that is something that you need you need to weigh out with your physician if, if you think that there's these long-term cognitive and behavioral outcomes because your medication is also managing those seizures. So you don't want those to recur because as Dr. Sperling had already brought up, recurrent seizures can then cause cognitive and behavioral problems. It's, it's kind of like a vicious, it's a very vicious cycle. So I would definitely consult with your physician about that, but, but absolutely the longer-term seizures, the longer-term treatments can cause these um, cognitive and behavioral problems. Okay, thank you. Lots of questions here. Um, are there any apps out there that can help with cognitive issues? So there, there's a couple apps that you can use specifically. I mean, if you're specifically looking at memory, there's a lot of, a lot of people use calendar apps or you can set a phone reminder. Um, there are some for a variety of different things. You know, I've lost my phone and it can, it can track that. Um, depending on what your specific issues are, yeah, there's there's a lot of apps that you can find. Sometimes people help. And again, if you're experiencing really big problems in everyday life, that's something you could consider. You know, you can just kind of discuss with your physician. Do you need some type of evaluation or do, do you need some kind of referral? Like I had mentioned about that cognitive rehabilitation therapy. I think that's really useful for people. Uh, you can even work, like I said, with your family member on how they can best structure the environment, whether you're able to use that, those strategies independently or someone can um, initiate those for you. Just to add to that, at the EFEPA, we do have um, a program called Hopscotch. It's to help with uh, memory and cognition. So if you were interested in that, it's for adults. You can get in touch with us. Um, it, it's a great program. It helps you with some memory strategies and tips and tricks to help with it. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, um, next question is, um, can you target therapies to area of intelligence? I'm interested in knowing ways to help my son's processing speed. It is way lower than the other areas he scored for IQ. Yeah, so again, like I said, it, it's really tough when they're managing those seizures. Uh, the processing speed is one that, that really does take a hit with a lot of these anti-analeptic medications. Um, Again, I would I would see if you can talk to your your physician about some some kind of management of that or some kind of I mean sometimes what ends up happening with if if somebody's slow you, the intervention in a school would be to give them extended time just different things like that um, but it might just take him a little bit longer unless treatment is modified if if assuming that's even appropriate. Thank you. Um, does brain surgery lead to an increased chance of depression? So that, that is a good question. That would be something I, I would definitely talk to if you're considering some type of brain surgery, I would definitely talk to the surgeon that you're talking to about that and to see what they, they in general, they're pretty knowledgeable about the research that they have with that. And I would absolutely talk to them about, you know, what they think that the, the outcomes would be with your specific situation. Thank you. Okay, um, my whole, someone wrote, my whole life I never focused on my medicines having side effects because my, uh, my mom was the one that controlled everything, but I do have trouble saying words. 
I never knew Keppra had a side effect. Can it be a learning disability or a side effect from the medicine? So there can be a variety of factors that cause you difficulties with cognitive functioning. I mean, you would, to more clearly tease that out again, like I, you would need to go to your doctor and I mean, a formal evaluation would kind of help you, especially, I'm not sure what your age is or if you're in school, but if you're looking for some kind of accommodations or future, in, you know, for employment or school or something like that, and you're wondering, do I have a learning disability? Do I have, you know, something else? It might be useful to get that further evaluated. Again, even just with having seizures, you're entitled to accommodations through the American Disabil with Disabilities Act for school, for work, for different things like that. So again, I'm not sure what the specific circumstance is, but it, it could be a variety of factors. There's comorbid learning disabilities or um, medication side effects could be impacting that. Thank you. And our last question here, is a neuropsych evaluation always necessary? And do you have anything like hopscotch for teens? I will say for hopscotch, um, that's kind of a case-by-case -case basis. So I will connect with you about that. Um, your teen might be appropriate for the program. And Dr. Aaron Esposito, if you want to um, answer the other question, is a neuropsych eval always necessary? So a lot of times people will come in for a neuropsych eval if they have, um, if they have had, if they're considering a surgical intervention or considering a change in treatment, noticing um, some thinking changes. Some, uh, some people, um, some physicians would like to get a baseline. So then, you know, if you make the changes in treatment, then you'll have that information. Again, that, that is something that they would have to refer you for your, your specific physician. So if you think it's something that that's useful or would be helpful, you would have to talk to your, your physician about that. But um, in general, they can, they can be informative for a lot of different reasons that we've discussed. Wonderful. Thank you so much for all the information for your time today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks. All right. So stick around. We're going to have Mary tell you about some upcoming events. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Okay, well, um, we're talking about the walks and epilepsy. It's going to end the virtual walk month. So it's this Saturday, November, I'm sorry, October 24th. Hold on a second. Okay. Okay, yeah. Okay, so it's a purple pop up party, and it's going to be at Mohegan Sun Arena, uh, KC Plaza there in Wilkes-Barre. And I know some of you aren't from the area, but it's a nice time to take a drive up north. But it's going to be Saturday morning from 9 a.m. till 12 p.m. Deck out your cars in purple, write messages, uh, wave signs, come through um, the parking lot. We're gonna have drive-throughs where we're gonna have different stops where you get your swag bag. Um, if you made a donation, you could pick up a t-shirt, uh, we're going to give you purple ribbons, um, and you can tie some messaging onto our Epilepsy Warrior wall. We're going to have live music, and it should be a really fun day to be socially distanced, but still be able to see some familiar faces and connect with groups. And we're really excited about it. And also, uh, we're tying purple ribbons around the area, so you'll be seeing that in November for Epilepsy Awareness Month. We're going to be in every county putting ribbons around courthouses. And if you need some ribbons, just let us know. We can get them for you. And also, there's another walk that's coming up, or I'm sorry, another virtual conference, November 7th at 9 a.m. And this conference is going to have topics of managing for caregiver and people living with epilepsy, a doctor-patient relationships, planning for the future, updates on anti-epileptic drugs. So you can log on there and register for that great conference. And if there's any last questions, please let us know, use your chat button. Otherwise complete the second poll if you would. And we thank you for attending tonight and for your time and patience. Everybody stay healthy, stay safe till we meet again. And remember, you are not alone. Thank you.